this definition almost as old as myself still holds true nobody has challenged this health is not only absence of disease it is physical social and mental well being can i interrupt my talk to request you uh, to think for a minute is the global healthcare system actually trying to deliver this would anybody have a response to that many of you are healthcare professionals are we giving health care? not i am not asking the palliative care people here i am asking about the global healthcare system as a healthcare person i am asking myself is the global healthcare system actually delivering this what do you think yes to uh, come into a definitive diagnosis by running lab, uh, you know, blood work and investigations and, and then giving the treatment, which is in the form of medications. That's it. So But why? I mean, we have this definition. Yeah. We ha call ourselves healthcare people. Why are we not trying to deliver this? What could be the possible reason? we were not trained i'm a medical doctor and i was not trained to look after the social well-being of of the pa my patient so i'm all i'm i'm trained i was trained to just treat the the disease the illness that's it isn't that strange yeah no is that could that be because doing what you described is simply convenient for us for the healthcare system to use the machines to diagnose to do interventions mm -hmm. to give medicines write prescriptions that's convenient maybe going into the social emotional or spiritual issues is not convenient and not measurable we like measurable things we th like things that we can weigh on a scale and measure out in milligrams and dispense love yeah. is not easily measurable and compassion is not easily measurable and we have so far avoided that yes doctor um, you know, going into the mental or social well-being of people just doesn't pay in our system <coughs> and that's a real problem or in any system doctor uh, if um, the doctor spends two hours performing an operation imagine how much the person can be built two hours of sitting there and holding a hand and listening how much can you how much can you ask the person to pay very little very little yeah. so essentially we healthcare system is doing what is convenient for us and what is profitable for us and maybe not thinking as healthcare professionals but thinking as tomorrow's patients and thinking of as family members of tomorrow's patients we need to ask ourselves shouldn't we be be demanding a little more or shouldn't we be trying to create a system that's a little more responsible because what we are doing is sheer irresponsibility Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Doris, you heard this story once already. Uh, the young woman had advanced cancer of the breast. She had severe pain, and every time she took morphine, the pain would subside, but. the home visit team never found her pain free because she was very irregular with medicines um she her husband was in the army he was terrified of the husband who would come home only for one month every year she had two small kids they were being taken care of her sister in law and um, 
I, I was asked to see her because she was so, so much in pain. I, I mean, like, she was rather very defensive. Many people had been lecturing her about taking morphine every four hours. So when I sat down beside her and said, if you are not taking the medicines for hourly, there must be a very good reason. Tell me what it is. She first said, uh, it upsets my tummy. It gives me constipation. But then I pointed out that, okay, you had the tummy upset first when you took the ibuprofen, not this. And the constipation was relieved when you took the laxative. So maybe there is something more. <coughs> he said, four hourly, I can't tell the time, I don't have a watch. So I said, there is a clock in the living room. Let me bring it up, down and hang it in front of you. I don't look like it. I don't like looking at the clock. I asked, why is it that you don't like looking at the clock? And she said, the clock tells me that time is passing. And then all the story came out. Her fear of death, fear of leaving the children alone, the fear of the husband remarrying and a stepmother being cruel to the kids. At the same time, upset that the children were getting attached more to the sister-in-law than to her. All these conflicting emotions were troubling her. A lot of conversation later, it also came out that uh, she had as a teenager once attempted suicide by jumping into a well. Uh, and then it was brought out that she had suffered from clinical depression off and on. All these things came out and that is the kind of total pain that Cecily Saunders talked all about a long time back. And I am quite convinced that if our healthcare team continues to be what it, continued to be what it was a few years back, with four doctors, 12 nurses, and one medical social worker, we would have got nowhere. We are able to take care of these things at least up to a point. Nowhere near adequate, but at least up to a point, because we encouraged lay members of the community to come into our team and help out. This statement by a, <clears throat> was by a rather famous psychiatrist. What do you think about that statement? And I'm taking a liberty with that and modifying it a little bit. Why oh, only mental? Health as a whole. If health is that kind of well-being, how can it be just delivered by the healthcare system? It has to be a partnership between us and the patient and family, if possible, expanded into the community around them. This <coughs> brings me to the concept of social capital. I would, let me take a liberty with that definition and say that social capital is the essence of goodness in the community. Many of you have been to many countries. Can you tell me any place anywhere in the globe where there wouldn't be a few compassionate people who get sheer pleasure out, help, pleasure out of helping someone else? I am a stranger to your country. When I go out by myself, so far I've had Doris holding my arm, but when I go out myself and ask for directions, I find people are so helpful. They are so keen. They see that there's this strange kind of being lost somewhere. They make sure that I get the right direction. That intrinsic goodness is still there in most people. We are just giving people the privilege of finding meaning in their own lives. Young school children, college students, and um, retired people, they all want something that gives them more meaning than just studying textbooks and regurgitating at the exam 
or just now retired life relaxed life after one week they have had enough of relaxation they want something to do with their time and we are giving them the privilege of making meaning out of their lives now the problem with the micro element of today's social capital all the goodness is within the nuclear family which has less and less connection with the community around them and the hospitals are now becoming bigger and bigger and more and more corporate huge palaces she is a total stranger there in my state of kerala that is deep south of india tiny state what we did was to rebuild the miso element of the social capital allowing the community to come in and help the connection between the corporate system or the government's hospitals and the nuclear families reconnecting them let me expand that middle picture 2016 second saturday of october world palliative care day our team decided to give a treat to the paraplegics that we care for by the way uh, in your country paraplegia is doesn't come under the purview of palliative care i suppose because they are rehabilitated they are part of society in my world that is 85% of the world paraplegia is a life threatening disease threatened by pressure sores septicemia repeated urinary infections and life within four walls homes are not barrier free roads are not barrier free supermarkets are not barrier free they are unable to go out to get these people to the seaside for a treat each needed four volunteers about uh, nearly 50 people got together on wheelchair each needed four strong men to pick them up physically seated on a chair carry them to a road because most of them do not have road access and then bring them here so about 150 students came and you should have seen the glow on their faces and that perhaps was the most meaningful day of their lives also and what it meant to these people that girl in red and green second from that side she does not have normal sensation in her feet and she said the waves touching my feet was the best experience that i have had in my whole life is that healthcare giving her that experience going back to that definition and could we doctors and nurses alone have ever given that kind of healthcare at its depth this kind of thinking from their point of view and providing more than what the hospital or the institution can give is what we achieve by engaging the community unfortunately though there are good people everywhere the the community does not get together to form healthcare and uh, you asked me this morning what do we how, do, how what advice would you give them to get engaged in healthcare and my response still is it cannot be done by giving them advice the change has to come from us because healthcare is an intimidating field to any non medical person how can they even dare to step in where we use words this long no diagnosis pronounceable even and the machines are so intimidating how will they ever dare to enter our field unless we invite them what we do is wherever we can get a few people to listen we do awareness programs we have social one social worker assisted by a few volunteers who do only this they run awareness programs almost invariably two or three people said how can we help can we become volunteers we get them to meet and when there are enough people we do volunteers training program they need some information about what they can do and what they should not do 
we facilitate that. Uh, even simple things including hand washing, about how to listen, about how not to talk, about how not to inflict on personal convictions and beliefs on the hapless patients. These things are taught and understood. We encourage each group to form as an organization. So in that locality, if it is 12th Street residents, they form their own organization. We found that to be very useful after the first few years because then now they have an organization that they can take ownership about. And I believe that is important for sustainability. They are not our branches. They are our partners. The organization or the group belongs to themselves. Sometimes when they are large enough, we encourage them to formally register as a charitable organization to improve accountability. But we continue to do the hand-holding. Very often they do not have all that they need. They will need professional advice and that has to be provided by us. But eventually some of them develop their own uh, professional uh, support system. I, have, I, am, I know of, I mean, even in Trivandrum, where I work, two organizations have employed now professionals. One has employed a doctor part-time and a nurse full-time. Another has employed a nurse full-time. And they develop this so that they are able to do more and more in their community. So that we do not have to provide all the support all the time. And because these volunteers are engaged, many things happen. Like that woman following a hip surgery, like many people undergoing surgery would have uh, been bedridden because there is no effective rehabilitation program. A volunteer went to her almost every day for three weeks and would say, Amma, come, get up, let us walk. Let us walk a little, let me walk with you. He encouraged her to exercise, to walk and finally got her back on her feet. We doctors and nurses couldn't have done that alone. And uh, the volunteers help us to find the needy patients. They tell us uh, somebody has become ill and there is nobody to look after them. And this woman in that hut possibly would have never seen a doctor if we had not reached there. And we wouldn't have reached there without the volunteers in the community. She gets a home visit every week by our team. They take medicines with them and dispense them and uh, make sure that her condition in within that humble home is as good as possible. And because we have the volunteers, we are able to do adequate education of families. The, one of the fortunate things in our environment is that though it is dwindling, generally there is still a family structure. Patients usually are not left alone. There are people helping them. And we, uh, the volunteers and our team, teach them and make them part of the system. With the result that from some of those families, those who gained a lot of palliative care experience by nursing a mother or a father or a spouse, they themselves become strong volunteers for the future. And because the volunteers are involved, we are able to do some things. Like we, palliative care is improving quality of life for the patient and the family, not forgetting the children. We found that in a lot of homes, because of the financial destruction by treatment, children drop out of school. And we make sure that uh, children's education is supported. We now look after the education of more than 300 children. We have had a doctor passing out uh, from that group, several nurses, engineers, and others to get an earning capacity for the family. It is not only helping that child, it's helping the whole family. And when we go back, the very next day, we'll be participating in their annual summer camp where um, children from high school will be brought together for a three-day uh, stay there 
with some fun some learning and some interaction making new friends and getting exposure to the world more than a little that they are confined to in their own homes and by doing all this i believe that certainly we are helping patients and families but it's also helping ourselves all the healthcare workers are now getting more satisfaction out of their work we often talk about burnout of doctors i don't know how common that is in palliative care in this country but we generally find that professionals and volunteers get a lot of satisfaction from their work simply because we are no longer running away from suffering we are facing suffering we now have the capacity to do something about it and that gives us better morale that's my feeling our organization palim india tries to get this do this all over the country we find pioneers champions who have the keen who are keen and help them to build capacity and to help keep on helping others but i can also tell you the other elements of our work are easier but getting doctors to accept community involvement is harder they are not used to it and uh, hospitals are generally not very keen on it and that paradigm shift comes much slower <coughs> looking on the bright side we have had some successes the national program for palliative care created by the government of india does at least profess to engage the community that is as one of the sixth one of the six objectives of the program we have got the law governing opioids changed in 2014 so that access to opioids for pain relief is easier now we have got the medical council to accept palliative medicine as a specialty though we have not been successful in introducing palliative care into undergraduate medical and nursing education yet uh, in my own state of kerala the government has a palliative care policy so that every primary health center now has at least one nurse full with training in palliative care working full time in palliative care but then my state is only 3% of india's population Uh, much of the work was uh, supported because in 2008 we went to the supreme court with a public interest litigation uh, that could have been a double edged sword but uh, we try to explain to the officials it is not a conflict it's a conciliatory uh, public interest litigation it's a facilitatory thing etc somehow we manage and that helped many of the governmental changes do we i mention it last we see it as our major focus for the future i because we know that healthcare is a partnership between the person and the family and the medical system improving public awareness is keen is the key to development of further compassionate healthcare and palliative care in the future and that we have been doing it amateurishly we need to build the capacity and do advocacy more effectively and efficiently uh, i shall stop there um, thank him with um, gra- very g- great gratitude to all of you for listening to me patiently and also with with gratitude for what you are doing to build compassionate communities here in canada uh, that that's my email id and i hope we can continue to work together because i find that i have so much to learn from what you do here thank you all very much thank you